Hi everyone, I'm Kathy Cooper. I'm the director of CSR's Division of Receipt and Referral. And today what I'm going to talk about is how NIH processes and assigns the applications that you submit to us. I'm really going to focus on just this little part of the pie from the time you uh, initiate your idea to the time you get funding to do it. I'll start talking just a titch about grant submission um, because that's very important to us. I will talk a lot about how we assign the applications, but I'll stop talking before the applications actually get to the study section. So you can submit your application electronically one of three ways. You can either use NIH's ASSIST system, which is the one I recommend. You can use a home-built or commercially available system-to-system -system solution, or you can use grants.gov workspace. Regardless of which of these systems you use, once you hit the submission button, your application takes the same path. It goes first to grants.gov, which does a few checks, like whether the funding opportunity announcement is open or not. Then it is retrieved by the NIH. And at that point in time, we do a lot of electronic checks and validations um, that may cause your application to be rejected and need to be resubmitted. But when everything goes fine, it comes through all the way through to the NIH. Very important, your application must be submitted on time. And on time means 5 p.m. local time. That, so if you're in Hawaii, that means your application needs to come in 5 p.m. Hawaii time. If you're on vacation in Hawaii, but your organization is in New York, it needs to come in 5 p.m. New York time because it's the time of the applicant organization. We have a lot of standard due dates and they just happen to fall on a weekend or holiday sometimes. Those automatically roll forward to the next business day. So if your due date shows up on a Saturday, you have until Monday to submit that application. Again, because it's due at 5 p.m., the application needs to be in the door at 5 p.m. Things that come in after 5 p.m. are considered to be late and subject to our late policy, and we may not be able to accept them. So let me talk about the two-day viewing window after your application is submitted. This is a great opportunity for you, but it's a little bit tricky as well. So I need to tell you two things. First of all, we always say, follow your application all the way through to the NIH, and then view it when it shows up on ERA Commons. Make sure that your application is in exactly the right shape for reviewers to consider it. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes you view it and you've determined you need to replace something or fix something. If you um, submit your application early, you may have the full two-day viewing window to work on it. The two-day viewing window is the day you submit in the next two business days. That is why we say submit early. Um, some people, if they submit two hours before the deadline, then they have two hours to work on their application because all changes and corrections and updates to your application must be made before that 5 p.m. deadline or your application is considered to be late. And we do take some late applications and we don't slam the door shut when the deadline passes because we want the opportunity to see why you didn't get your application in the door. We don't give approval in advance, but we do require that you put a cover letter on your application and tell us about the problems you had or the reason that the application is submitted late. Uh, these problems must apply to one of the principal investigators, which can include a multiple principal investigator. And we have a number of reasons, such as federal computer systems issues, a review service by a PI, uh, acute illness of the PI or a family member, which are reasons that we would be able to take your application late. Um, so I would recommend that you look at this guide notice listed at the bottom of the slide and see the full policy um, because your application coming in late depends upon you meeting that uh, policy. So once it comes in through the grants.gov pipeline and negotiates the two-day viewing window, it ends up in the division of receipt and referral, which is my division. We process all income applications for NIH, but we also process applications for other operating divisions of health and human services, such as CDC or FDA. 
of the NIH applications, about 25% of those are destined to go for review in one of the institute review shops. The remaining majority, about 75% most of the time, go for review in a CSR study section. Since that's most likely where your application will be reviewed, I'll focus on CSR review for the rest of this talk. So division of receipt and referral, who are we? Um, we are doctoral level scientists with broad scientific background. I have eight full-time staff that do nothing but process your applications. Plus, I also have 20 part-time referral officers. These are also people who are full-time CSR scientific review officers. And so they're basically doing two jobs at once, um, including they're the ones that are more likely to be the people who are selecting the institute to assign your application and also directing your application toward an appropriate scientific review group. We're all expert in the institutes and what their interests are and their limits are. We know what the CSR review groups review and we're also um, very knowledgeable about NIH policy as it relates to receipt and referral of applications. So we make decisions based on a number of factors. Um, first of all, we uh, want to know that the institute that we would assign your application to participates in the funding opportunity announcement that we also call FOA. Uh, we would make that decision based on the, the scope of the IC's mission and their referral guidelines. Uh, we look at the locus of review agreements for review. So some of those applications are reviewed at an institute, and so they would go there, not a CSR study section. And sometimes for special initiatives, we cluster applications in review. But for the ones that go to CSR that are not clustered, then we use the guidelines that are posted on the internet that you can also see. Okay, so first here, let's talk about the um, IC assignment. Key thing, the institute that would take your application has got to be on the FOA in order for us to assign it. The top of every FOA, there's a list called Component of Participating Organizations, and it lists all of the institutes that are eligible to take applications through that FOA. Every single round, we get a lot of applications that are submitted to FOAs where the institute that would be appropriate for that application is not on the FOA. Sometimes we can fix it, but sometimes we can't. Sometimes we have to withdraw the application. So I would highly recommend that you take a look at that list before you use a particular FOA to submit your application and make sure that the IC that you know will be appropriate for you is listed on that list. What if you're not sure whether the IC on that list is appropriate for you? So I have a tip, and that would be to use a tool called Matchmaker. Um, it's part of the NIH reporter system, and it uses a database of funded grants. What you would do is you would put in your specific aims or abstract. I like specific aims. I think it has more information in it. And run Matchmaker and it provides you an output like this. And so you can see in the first column, it tells you what institute other applications like yours were funded by. So that's really important. Um, it gives you a list of similar applications so that you can look and see the applications the more important thing it does is it can route you to a program officer. And I always highly recommend to applicants, particularly when they're not sure, to reach out to a program officer to find out what their institute is interested in taking and more importantly, interested in supporting. And you can get contact information for program officers here from this output list. So let's go on to review. So again, we're back at that 75% of applications that are reviewed at CSR. The rough path is they come into DRR. Our staff then passes them on to a uh, IRG chief, which is the uh, leader that manages a group of study sections. Uh, that chief is the one who makes the final decision about whether the application is appropriate for review in one of his or her study sections and then makes the final assignment of that application. Um, they use pretty much the same resources you have access to. They use those guidelines that CSR has posted on the internet and they also use the assisted referral tool called ART and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a moment. 
So you can get information about CSR study sections a couple of ways. One is you can go straight to our website. You can browse these various categories um, and look at various study sections and see if they're of interest to you and if look like they're appropriate for your science. Or you can use the assisted referral tool. This works a lot like Matchmaker, but it is based on the universe of applications reviewed in a study section, not necessarily just the ones that were funded. Um, and you put in your abstract or specific aims, and again, I think specific aims are a little bit meatier, and the title, and you can run that. And what you get is you get suggestions of study sections that are thinks might be appropriate for your science. They're categorized as either strong or possible. The study sections are returned to you in alphabetical order so that the one at the top doesn't mean it's the strongest match um, because we were having some issues with uh, applicants getting the wrong idea. So for this one example, let's see. The one of the strong op uh, matches was NPASS. So if you go to follow the links to NPASS, you get a lot of information. You can find out who the SRO is with her contact information. So if you'd wanted to reach out to the SRO to get more information about the study section, um, she could provide that to you. But also what you get is the written guidelines for that study section. And these are the exact same guidelines we use for assigning the applications. Probably even more important, you can get information about the reviewers who've been reviewing on that study section so that you can get the membership roster and also the roster of the actual reviewers, which it would include temporary or ad hoc reviewers that reviewed at that meeting for the last three meetings. So you get a really good idea of, of who is going to be on there and able to review your application. So at the end of the day, you might have some definite ideas about what you want. A particular institute looks better than another. There's a couple of study sections that look pretty good, but you would prefer study section A over study section B. So how do you tell us about that? Well, you use the assignment request form. Um, this form is available in all application packages, so whether you use ASSIST or System to System or Grants.gov workspace, it's in there. You don't have to use it. Um, but definitely it is available for you if you would like to, um, and that that is the way you would communicate to us any preferences for study section or IC assignment, and also let us know if there's somebody out there who has a conflict that shouldn't be reviewing your application, or you can even give us general categories of science uh, that need to be covered to review your application in your opinion. It's a pretty simple form. This is what it looks like. Um, there's three boxes to put in potential institute requests. There's three boxes to put in potential study section requests. Please note that these are not first choice, second choice, third choice. They're just three requests and we will pick the best one from there um, if one of those fit. The end of the day, we try to honor your request, um, but we absolutely positively want to make sure that your application ends up in a study section where the review is very high quality and solid. Um, so if we can on your request and do that, we'll, we'll do that. If we can't, we will let you know. We will um, give you a communication through ERA Commons to let you know why we didn't honor your request. However, you don't have to request. My staff know how to route your applications and they make a pretty good choice on their own. So you can let us make the decision for you. We're pretty good at this. So in addition to the assignments, we also look at policy. We're not able to screen every application stem to stern because it would take us months to get the applications out for review, but we start the process. So when the electronic system is looking at very binary things, like did you put an attachment that's required on the application, we look at things in the attachment that the system can't check. So we also look at late applications and make the decision about that. We look at font and format. We don't want somebody squishing their application down to six point font just to get more information in it. Um, we also look for what we call overstuffing, which is people want to get more information in their application to maybe gain a competitive advantage. And so they put extra material in the appendix or the other attachments or the human sub section or something like that. And so we try to identify those. 
We also look for duplicate and overlapping applications for a variety of reasons, including that NIH really wants to support great science, but we want to do it once, not twice. And then finally, we look for unallowable resubmissions. Even though we've only allowed a single resubmission for the past 10 years, there's some applicants out there that still go for that second resubmission. So we try to screen those out as well, because those would not be fundable at the end of the day. So at the end of review, what do you have? So you have your IC assignment. Um, you could get a primary and dual, so there, sometimes there will be multiple ICs on your application if there's multiple ICs that would be interested in your science. Um, you will eventually get a program officer assignment. That ball is rolling, but they haven't necessarily assigned the PO yet. You'll have an application number. As soon as the chief clears his or her queue, you'll have the study section assignment. And as soon as you have the study section assignment, you'll know who your SRO is. All of this information is available on the ERA Common Status View page for your application. Um, and very importantly, you'll have the, the name and contact information for both the SRO and the program officer, but you will also, as it is scheduled, you will know the meeting date and time. And I know most of you are very anxious to get those results, and so this will let you know when to start looking for them. Sometimes during submission, you really need to talk to somebody. So who do you talk to when? Definitely, if you're trying to submit your application and you're hitting errors and you're not getting in, please, the first person you contact is the ERA Common Service Desk. If they're not the right people to speak to, they will send you to the right people to speak to. Plus, more importantly, if you're having a federal computer system issue, they'll be able to verify and document that. And that's one of the reasons that we can accept a late application. If the application has made it in, but it hasn't been assigned yet, definitely reach out to the Division of Receipt and Referral if you have any questions. We have a telephone number where you can talk to a human from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Time, or an email address that you can send to us, and we usually get into those and clear those probably within 24 hours. If it's already been processed and the application is under review, you have a couple of options. Um, Talk to the scientific review officer if you have an administrative or a process question. If you have a scientific question, definitely it's the program officer assigned to your application that you'll want to reach out to. And then after review, the program officer is your contact. The SRO is not. And anytime, please feel free to reach out to the Division of Receipt and Referral if you have any kind of questions. We'd love to talk to you. Um, again, we have our email here and our phone number um, where you can um, get to us on a fairly expeditious basis. Another thing I'd like to recommend to people is to subscribe to the NIH Guide Listserv. What this does for you is every Friday in your email inbox, you get a summary of all of the funding opportunity announcements, notices, and other things that have been published during that week. And so you might find FOAs and opportunities that are really important for you to think about submitting an application through policy changes, changes in requirement for a FOA that you're already planning to use. So this is definitely worth your time and it's really not much of a burden to put in your inbox and just scan once a week. And then finally, I would just like to say thank you for listening to my talk and also rescore re that I would love to talk to you anytime that you need information or my staff would love to talk to you. So please don't hesitate to use the phone number and email that I've shared in this talk to reach out anytime and we'll try to solve your problem or give you information that you need. Thanks so much.